everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Moyer, and I'm going to be the host along with Amy Morrison. So um, welcome to Solutionary Perspectives. Solutionary Perspectives is presented by Solutionary Rail, featuring community and technical experts uh, that intersect, whose expertise intersect with the Solutionary Rail approach to decarbonizing transportation and energy infrastructure in the U.S. Today, our theme is electric vehicles, smart growth, and environmental justice. Electric vehicles are touted as a key component of, to solving our climate crisis. Many consumers are jumping on the EV bandwagon and companies like Amazon are building a fleet of sh to ship goods by electric truck. Likewise, national environmental organizations are, are pushing EVs as key to lowering greenhouse gas emissions and transitioning to a green economy. All of this is quite reasonable, but are EVs in and of themselves a real climate solution? Autocentric urban and regional design reinforce systemic inequalities regardless of the fuel source. Electric vehicles are an important tool in the fight against the climate crisis, but they are not the only tool we need if we wish to have transformative human and environmental justice as envisioned by frameworks such as the Green New Deal. This discussion will inv investigate how electric vehicles can work in unison with a mode shift from cars and trucks to rail, smart growth development policies, lithium battery recycling, and the mitigation of lithium mining impacts on the global south for a comprehensive and equitable response to the climate crisis. We are joined by our very special guest, Robert Colon, he, they, Robert is an interdisciplinary landscape and urban designer with a background in research chemistry, civics, and pu public health advocacy. He graduated from Florida International University's Masters of Landscape Architecture and Environmental and Urban Design program, and from Northeastern University with a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry and a minor in Biology. In 2020, Robert was awarded the Olmsted Scholar Award for dedicating his career to bridging the gaps between the bountiful and innovative knowledge produced by science and effective action through design. Robert is passionate about mass transportation and freight mode shift to rail as catalysts for the transformative change we need to confront the climate crisis and bring equity to our communities. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Robert to take over and lead us through a very um, important discussion. Thank you, Robert. It's been such an honor thus far to be able to work with you on Solutionary Rail. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Thanks, Bill. That was such an awesome introduction. Uh, I also want to say thank you to the many, many people who are on this call who helped me prepare this presentation, who provided critiques, who gave me knowledge, and who made this possible. So like Bill mentioned, electric vehicles have an important part to play in our transition for the climate crisis. But what I would invite everybody to do today is sort of open our minds to thinking about how we can move beyond just thinking about purchasing our way out of the climate crisis. In my perspective, it's not just about sort of switching out one technology for another, but really changing how we do business, changing how we relate to each other and our environment and all of these factors that really beyond just producing CO2. So today we're gonna to talk about a few things that are often left out of the conversation but are incredibly related. So we're gonna talk about electric vehicles, smart growth, which is a set of principles for urban and regional development and environmental justice. And we're gonna talk about how all these things relate and fit into each other. So as an introduction, smart growth is a series of principles championed by the EPA and a lot of environmental organizations, a lot of urban planning organizations that produce communities that are economically thriving, environmentally thriving, and also have justice for their people. They work for everybody, not just a select few. So the 10 main principles are this, to mix land uses, to take advantage of compact building design, to create a range of housing opportunities and choices, to create walkable neighborhoods, 
to foster distinctive and attractive communities that have a really strong sense of place. They're really unique. We preserve our open space, our farmlands, our natural beauty, and our critical environmental areas. We strengthen and direct development towards our existing communities, not just building new ones without watching out for the people who are already here. Provide a variety of transportation choices, make development decisions predictable, fair, and cost-effective, and encourage community and stakeholder collaboration in development decisions. Having the people who are in our communities involved in how they're transformed, not just allowing a developer to build a community from scratch and allow people to move there. I'm sure a lot of us are really familiar with these images. This could be pretty much anywhere in America and you would believe it. So these places don't have a sort of strong sense of place. And what do all these places have in common? They're all car oriented development. Their issues don't come from the fact that the cars are producing CO2. They come from the fact that the entire community is designed around cars rather than people. You can see on top on the left, a strode, a combination of a street, which is for people and a road, which is for cars, a giant highway interchange, which is larger than a lot of major cities around the world, a typical, very homogeneous cookie cutter suburban community and an interstate that's too dangerous to be crossed. These communities don't meet any of the smart growth principles. They're consumptive, they're all the same, and they don't make money. You know, a typical suburban planned community doesn't have taxable businesses. You know, there's a saying, a parked car never purchased anything. <laughs> um, these communities can only sustain big box stores. You don't see a lot of unique restaurants and businesses in places here because there's not enough foot traffic to sustain them. You pretty much have to have a car to be able to access the resources of these communities. So this is an excerpt um, from my master's thesis, which was about halting suburban sprawl um, and a piece of analysis of what I discovered about suburban sprawl. So for those of you who might not know, the urban to rural transect is sort of an imaginary line. If we cut a slice from our urban core, our downtown, all the way to our rural and wild areas where the farms are, where the sort of wild areas are. And currently with the suburban development car oriented planning model, we treat land as nothing but a commodity. Every single one of its uses is compartmentalized. We're not treating land as something that provides our basic needs. We're treating it as something to be consumed, transformed and sold. And as a consequence of this, housing, suburban sprawl is consuming our rural areas. It's consuming the land where our food is produced. It's consuming the land where our wilderness lives, where our biodiversity lives, where our floodplains are. And using the example of Florida, which I studied, the result of this is 80% of Florida's meals are not locally sourced in the sunshine state, in a state that receives bountiful rain, where we could reasonably produce all of our food. We consume eight times more energy than we produce in the sunshine state, surrounded by tidal power with offshore wind power potential. So currently, diesel trucks are delivering 90% of our freight, 20% of our coal, diesel trains delivering 63% of our coal, and four major fragile pipelines are delivering our natural gas that power our state. So suburbia is truly this sort of unsustainable paradox. We're trying to get infinite growth, more consumption of this land to produce something to sell, suburban housing, but really with finite resources, a finite amount of land. To use the same area as a further example, let's look at Hillsborough County, uh, where I grew up. So what you can see here on the left in this great area with a blue line, that was the sort of the edge of the city in 1920, about a hundred years ago. And then you can see in the pink, how much has been developed in just a hundred years. And you can venture to guess what all this area looks like. One, two story buildings max, rather than densifying has just consumed almost the entire county. Looking towards the future, you can see now in blue, our current urban development boundary. And the plans in the future in pink and dark red, where this is planning to expand in the future, moving to the absolute corners of the county. We can see here inside the blue, inside the urban development boundary, these yellow and purple patches, which represent where they would like to densify in the future. You can see that the vast majority of the county will not be densified. 
They want to keep it the same and just add more and more and more of it, requiring more infrastructure and more resources. The consequence of this, you can see here on the right, is that there's no major wildlife corridor left in Hillsborough County. Large animals like panthers and other creatures that live here have no capacity to get through this very large piece of land, separating them from the ocean and it preventing the flow of chemicals, resources, wildlife that will keep this area providing life to us for a very long time. You can see all of this here together, how that has changed. And this has pretty dire consequences for Florida. You know, people are gonna keep moving here. This trend is increasing. This map on the left is from 1000 Friends of Florida. And you can see in red, the existing development. And by 2070, how much they plan to develop. It really looks like it covers all of the land in the state, except the Everglades and some of the Panhandle. The consequence of this, we have rural destruction. We're losing 75,000 acres of rural land to intensive development every year. We're losing rural culture, we're losing ranch lands, and we're having a hydrological disaster. All of this area is where our floodplains are. These protect the cities. The countryside serves a really important purpose. If you all remember in Houston, the great floods uh, quite recently, this is a direct consequence of that. And they've actually started to scale back some of their suburbs in response. Disease outbreaks are becoming more and more common as we're encroaching on wild areas, we're changing wildlife behavior. They're not used to what we're imposing upon them. So an animal that might not have bitten somebody before is gonna behave erratically and spread more diseases. Um, this is how many diseases such as Ebola, HIV, dengue have made the leap from animals to humans. And many people have made the same connection with COVID-19, which we don't fully know, you know how that exactly made the leap, but we do know it came from animals and more pandemics like this can happen uh, with this type of development. And of course, extinction. As we put roads and more fences, more walls, through these areas, large animals that require large areas of land won't be able to survive. Like you can see here, the Florida panther, whose top cause of death currently is car accidents. So bringing back that urban to rural transect, this is how it's envisioned in Solutionary Rail. I'm sure almost everybody here knows, but for those who don't, Solutionary Rail is the concept of combining commuter rail, freight rail, and renewable energy transmission on the same corridor and ideally electrifying that transportation. And by doing this, it gives us a really great opportunity to sort of unify the urban, suburban, and rural areas. Rather than trying to allow the suburban to consume the other areas, we can use the fact that freight and people can move back and forth to provide a mutually beneficial relationship between them all. So think of the rural areas producing food and shipping it into the city. Suburban areas hosting more jobs and having the capacity to commute to the city or visit the rural areas. And of course, especially important for the climate crisis, allowing us to maintain the renewable energy potential of our rural lands. These open spaces can host such a large variety of renewable energy. You could have solar panels, photovoltaic troughs, power towers, wind turbines, things that just aren't feasible in suburban or urban areas. We need these places, not just for food, but for energy. And then we can create sort of different combinations of our different needs in every part of the urban rural transect. Something that really blew my mind um, when I first read the Solutionary Rail textbook when working on my thesis was that by just having two parallel tracks with frequent crossings uh, for trains to sort of go back and forth, you can have seven times the freight and commuter capacity because trains can simply cross the tracks and get out of each other's way. And this is all with less than two times the overall cost of infrastructure. You might have twice the tracks, but you're gonna have the same number of crossings, the same number of stations and all these things. This is something that doesn't work on a car and truck oriented model, which just seeks to add more lanes, more lanes to the highways which in turn leads to more development, which in turn leads to the need for more lanes and so on in this vicious consumptive cycle. So what does an alternative development pattern really look like logistically? You know, not everyone wants to live in a tower and that's not exactly the vision that anybody should need for sort of good urban development. 
So let's break that down sort of step by step. Incremental development describes any set of policies in which homeowners are allowed to develop their land one increment of density up what it is now. So, you know, right now, most people are used to either a single family house or a high rise tower that's luxury and they can't afford. But what about the middle housing, the duplexes, quadplexes, townhouses, low rise, high rise? Incremental development policies empower existing homeowners to grow in wealth as their cities grow, as people move there. Rather than selling your home to a developer who will make all the money, you get to turn your home into a duplex um, and benefit from that and grow intergenerational wealth that will serve your family. As far as preserving sort of rural areas, many states such as Florida have transfer of development rights programs already. So what a transfer of development rights means is that a farmer or another rural enterprise gets to keep their land. It belongs to them. But they have the option of selling away the right to develop it, to turn it into suburban housing to the government. And often a developer could pay for that transfer of development rights. And what does everybody get out of this? A farmer is rewarded, paid for not selling their land uh, to a developer. They're compensated. Um, but also it would allow a developer within an urban area to supersede the incremental development. Say you choose not to develop a bunch of areas in a farm corridor. By doing so, by preserving those development rights in that area, you could then sort of go from single family house perhaps to a, a quadplex rather than a duplex. So a developer still has the ability to make money and have this uh, serve their local economy. And of course, conservation agencies, which are so critical for rural and wild lands. Currently in many states, there are programs that will fund farmers uh, not to farm certain parts of their land, especially places that are critical for flood control uh, and wildlife corridors. And then of course, places like parks that are just not farmed, not used for profit. And at the end of the day, all these things have to work in unison to make a system that benefits everyone along the urban rural transect, the urban homeowner, the rural farmer and the biodiverse wildlife that we need in our wild lands. And sort of serving everybody brings us into this topic of environmental justice. What does it mean to have justice when we're trying to, to serve our environment? Is it just meeting CO2 goals? Is it just saving animals from extinction? What about the people who are tied to the lands that we're protecting? So environmental justice is the fair treatment and the meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of their race, their color, their national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement and environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And this is from the US Department of Energy. And this was actually shared by the Sierra Club's website on the history of environmental justice. So cars have affected human inequalities in many, many ways. And a very large one has been enforcing segregation. And this is really important when we're talking about investing a lot of money into electric vehicles. Are we going to double down on something that has caused a lot of harm to many communities? Following the repeal of a lot of Jim Crow laws, the use of the interstates, strodes, and other large roads for cars has been used intentionally to segregate people. You can see these images um, from the Washington Post showing the history of how this has played out. In all of these cities, you can see green is black communities, blue is white communities, red is Asian communities, and orange is Hispanic. These major roads have divided people. Roads effectively function as walls. If it's too dangerous to cross, if it's too polluting to wanna to be near, if it's too hot to comfortably be there, it is a wall. And you can see this image on the right, we want white tenants in our white community. This really rose with the rise of white flight. White people using roads to flee urban areas as black people moved there for the suburbs and using roads to enforce this very real segregation. And very direct sort of economic impacts are felt by a car oriented culture. Someone mentioned in the very beginning of this conversation, I don't have an EV because I don't 
I can't afford one. You know, you can see here, the average annual cost of homeownership in the USA is over $9,000, according to AAA. In a nation that has such great wealth inequality, you can see here from the Economic Policy Institute, the difference in incomes based off race and ethnicity, um, $46,000 for a Black community, $98,000 uh, for an Asian community, $76,000 for a white community, or part, pardon me, a household. Asking everybody to purchase a car, an electric car, in order to access a job to get their kids to school, it simply isn't impossible and it's un, unfair burden to put on everybody to get us out of the climate crisis. And as I mentioned before, these major interstates and roads were used very intentionally to cripple certain communities and not others. So over time, Miami was once referred to as the Harlem of the South. In the age of Jim Crow, um, people of color were not allowed in Miami Beach after sundown uh, and were segregated from many places. Overtown was where black wealth really accumulated and was once a thriving community. With the rise of the interstate system, it just ruined their economy. People could no longer walk to the pedestrian businesses they once had. And this area has never financially recovered from this major piece of infrastructure. And of course, the big thing that we need to talk about is pollution. CO2 is a major polluter right now, causing the climate crisis, not good for our health, but it's not the only pollution that's coming from cars. And it's not pollution that's prevented by electric cars. Currently, when you're driving your car, you hit the brakes, your brake pad, which is full of metals, pushes up against your tire to stop it, causing both to grind and break down and produce a lot of particulate matter. Particulate matter is really tiny little particles that we breathe in, that get into our water. And because we regulate car exhaust, it is actually producing less pollution in the form of particulate matter than our brake pads are. Our brakes produce a thousand times more particulate matter um, than the actual exhaust. You can see in this chart here, as exhaust drops, the brake wear forms a greater percentage of the pollution from cars. So you can see here, we're already almost reaching this negligible red part for exhaust. But our brake wear, and as well as the road abrasion, a road made of asphalt, petroleum chemicals, our tire wear are now creating the bulk of our car pollution. All of this is now producing 28% of the microplastics that are in our ocean. How does it get in there? So when you're driving your car, you're, you're going along and your tires are putting friction up against the road, uh, often petroleum-based roads in the form of asphalt, and the road is wearing down, your tires are wearing down, your brake pads made of metals are wearing down, and then they're all coming out and settling on the roadway surfaces. The sun comes down, adds heat. Uh, if you remember in chemistry class, you gotta add the fire under your little beaker to get it going. That heat is making all of these chemicals more reactive and therefore more toxic. When the rain comes, all of these chemicals flush into the environment in one big toxic flush of a hyper-concentrated solution. Um, this often kills a lot of wildlife. And as you can imagine, the communities of people that live along these roadways are experiencing this as well. This has had impacts on wildlife. Uh, coho salmon have started to die off um, due to chemicals found in tires. And we actually found last year that microplastics were in human placentas. We, we can take this to assume that fetal tissue, therefore baby, child, human tissue is full of plastic. And as far as I know, there's no way to get that out. We don't know what the health effects are gonna be of all of this down the line. And now finally, I'd sort of like to talk about the environmental injustices and nuances of lithium production. Lithium ion technology is an incredibly powerful technology, one that we need to confront the climate crisis. It's gonna create batteries to allow us to store energy from solar and wind to heavy electric vehicles that we need. We need ambulances, we need buses, we need all the electric vehicles. Um, but there's a lot going on here that we need to break down. What you can see here are evaporation ponds um, from a lithium mining operation. So where does lithium come from? Much of the world's lithium comes from the lithium triangle in South America, which you can see here on the right. 
and it's found under salt flats, which are incredibly biodiverse and very unique precious ecosystems um, in Latin America. Underneath these salt flats, there are sort of, like you imagine in fourth grade geology class, <laughs> um, everything moving down there is pushing lithium up towards the surface. And what people do is they mix it with a lot of water and then uh, to sort of create this slurry and put it in a series of evaporation ponds, which over time get more and more concentrated until you get a lithium salt, which can be processed into what we will use for batteries. These salts from Latin America will often be shipped all the way to Asia, which is an incredibly carbonizing journey in, as you can imagine, these large cargo ships, um, then put into a vehicle that is shipped all the way back to us. It's an incredibly carbonizing cycle. And ultimately, it's sacrificing these ecosystems that we will not get back. As you can see here, a smartphone takes three grams of lithium, a laptop an ounce, a hybrid car three and a half pounds, but a Tesla, a large Tesla can use 112 pounds of lithium. When it takes 500,000 gallons of water to make one ton of lithium, imagine how many Teslas you can produce. You're not going to feasibly allow transportation for everybody using this uh, technology for cars. And this has had really, really big effects that people have been very vocal about um, in Latin America. You can see here on the left, um, an indigenous community that is protesting. And what they're saying translates to, we do not eat batteries. They take the water and life leaves. And the reason they're saying that is when we pump all of this slurry out of the ground to get to this lithium, we're creating a void. Where there was one lithium, there is now this empty space. And the water from the wells, the water used to drink for farming is getting sucked out by the pressure of those voids and going where that lithium once was. And of course, just the direct consumption of water to make all this slurry for the evaporation ponds. You know, these areas receive less than four inches of rain a year and now can no longer sustain themselves. In the middle, you can see an image from an area a mining town has gone through and what was once llama grazing land is now completely gone. As you can imagine, Latin America has had humans there for tens of thousands of years, um, incredibly rich cultures that have now just been wiped off the map by these processes. And the image on the right um, is in Tibet, and it's a river that was poisoned by lithium mine contamination. You know, we all grow up thinking oil spills, all of these things are chemicals, and any chemical, good or bad in large amounts, is toxic. Um, and can spill when we're creating this sort of global economy of shipping them around. A lawyer for these indigenous groups says it's a fairly straightforward colonial situation. And something of great concern and controversy is that currently there isn't a large enough supply for lithium to meet our demand um, because we are creating all these consumer products that are consuming a resource that we need for the climate crisis. You know, a lot of people will say, the mining industry will boom, they'll keep up, it'll be fine. But imagine what a boom could do if this is already happening in this one part of the world, if we're expanding it to other parts of the world, these impacts are going to start being felt everywhere. And like I said, we need this stuff. We need it to store solar wind energy to stabilize our power grids and to have the vehicles that we really need. We have to start being really smart about how we're using it. And that leads us to sort of this definition that I learned while researching for my thesis, ecofascism, the ideology marrying environmentalism and white supremacy. And this can be expanded beyond white supremacy to any form of institutional violence. If you have to deprive people of water or destroy another person's environment, another ecological community to become sustainable, then your vision of sustainability is a form of violence and not really a good way to be going forward. So looking towards alternatives to this, Moonshot Mode Shift is a policy of solutionary rail, imagining what would happen if we could put so much of our freight um, onto rail rather than onto trucks. You know, I think people are always so to think about uh, the passenger side. How do we get people out of cars? 
But in such a large consumer culture as ours, shipment is really such a major part of this. So the transportation sector is responsible for 30% of our greenhouse gas in the U.S. And tractor trailers are responsible for 44% of our highway maintenance costs. They don't pay for that. As Clyde in this conversation shared with me, they don't pay even half of what they cost. Trains, on the other hand, are 300% as energy efficient as trucks. So sort of steel on steel, bricks tires on asphalt. So every time that we put something onto a truck, instead of onto a train, we're consuming 300 times the fuel, um, or you can think of it as producing three times the CO2 to get stuff and people around. And you know, something that I thought was really wonderful that I learned about solutionary rail when researching it, if we lead with our freight, if we make these freight corridors functional again, they will naturally become functional for passenger rail, especially when you have two sets of tracks and can move trains back and forth. So you can see here um, a few different statistics of the moonshot mode shift goal. And all of this would reduce our annual diesel consumption by 10 to 20 billions of gallons. And I'd like to note, this isn't switching to electricity. This is just taking stuff off of trucks, putting it on to freight rail. Freight rail on lines that exist all over our country but aren't being utilized for the public good um, and are owned by private interests. Meeting these goals could decrease our greenhouse gas 100 million metric tons. And something that's very special about this campaign that really drew me to become involved in it and that really speaks to this theme of environmental justice is that we can make this work for everybody. We can involve our rail workers, our passengers, our farmers, the tribes affected by rail, trackside communities, green energy developers, rural electric co-ops, uh, railroad industry, and rural communities. People often think we're sacrificing something when we talk about living without cars, living without our combustion engine. And that's frankly not how I see it. I, I see everything that we have to gain um, especially when you look at the money that we're spending on all these infrastructures and technologies. Um, I'd like to show you a, a few works of landscape architecture that center around a transition to human-oriented spaces powered by mass transportation. Uh, this is the Cheonggichong Stream in Seoul, Korea. You can see on the left, this was once a double-decker highway, once considered sort of the pinnacle of modernism and the advancement of society. But this culture came to learn this was not the best use of their space, especially not in an incredible city such as this. So as they grew their ability for transportation through the use of rail, they transformed this corridor into an urban stream that recycles, treats, and uses stormwater that floods its metro system. And you can see here, this now includes native willow swamps, marshes, um, habitat for fish, amphibians, insects, birds, and is a 3.6 mile east-west green corridor. It's for pedestrians, cyclists, and wildlife. This is such an incredible thing that this city has gained um, by making this transition. And why I invited you in the beginning to think, what if we change the way we live our lives and we do business rather than just purchasing a different technology? Likewise, um, this is a park known as the Ramblas de Sants in Barcelona. Before, this was considered an incredibly industrial city, and that is what created the foundation of a lot of its wealth, but it wasn't without its consequences. You can see on the left that even a train, not just cars, can have a lot of negative consequences. It created a scar through the middle of the city that functionally segregated it, just like the interstate system has done here. And what they did here was cap it and create an incredible linear park with very comfortable ramps, escalators that bring people together from both sides that really intersects all the ways people are walking around their community to bring them together. It's not just a pedestrian bridge to get over. It's a place for community gathering, for people to come together and is a really thriving civic space. Uh, this is a great image from the Solutionary Rail campaign. 
So just to summarize some of the things that we spoke about today, um, about electric vehicles, they have their pros, we need them. We need to reduce exhaust and petroleum combustion. We need emergency vehicles, disability access, rural uses, a farmer's always gonna need a truck. But the cons is we still have this racially unjust development model that was built around cars. We still have this environmentally destructive development model that's consuming our rural lands, our wild lands, and it's economically insolvent. The businesses that these areas can sustain don't produce enough taxes for their own infrastructure. The people who are living in the city are paying the taxes for the people in the suburbs. And it's relying on extractive practices, land sacrifice and pollution. It puts an unfair uh, burden on indigenous people and sacrifices their way of life. And it continues tire wear pollution. And alone by itself, it's not a true climate solution. We can't buy our way out of the climate crisis. We need to change our relationship with each other, the environment, and how we relate to those things, how we get to those things and move um, goods and people back and forth. That's the end of this presentation. Um, I'd love to open it up to questions and discussion. Um, I see a great note from Bill here, road versus track, yeah, three to 400%, even more. <laughs> Yeah. So, hi, uh, Robert. Thank you so much. You know, I just wanted to make sure that people that we weren't didn't think we were saying three to four hundred times more efficient. It's three hundred, four hundred percent more efficient. Oh, so me. thank you <laughs> so much for that uh, presentation and all of your work. Um, it's just been incredible to to have uh, solutionary rail be enriched by your participation and the, um, the, the, the fresh analysis that you bring to the project, this your unique design perspective. It's uh, really, really, really healthy for us and I'm really grateful. Recently, I came across a couple of things. Uh, one was a, a, a battery locomotive that BNSF and Wabtec are uh, collaborating on in California. And it got a lot of hype and is getting a lot of hype. But one of the things I was trying, I wanted to bring up about that was that, hey, if we're, it, what's not so cool about that is that it's not really a replacement for overhead catenary wires to, uh, to for motive power for um, in that way for rail electrification. Mm -hmm. What is cool about it is it potentially bridges the gap in the most expensive place to put the overhead wires. Mm -hmm. And then a friend of mine sent, uh, Angela Logan from Moving Forward Network sent information about Siemens' um, new project to put, uh, put overhead uh, wires, uh, do electric truck lanes. And, and I thought, well, you know, that's pretty cool in a certain situation because it could reduce the waste stream and, um, and extractive uh, pressures from uh, more batteries. But what happens if they try to supplement um, that model with long haul trucks? So we're not solving the, um, the problem of tire pollution. So, you know, as you're helping us navigate um, this is a complex situation and we need to find the, 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 the answers are not black and white. They're not, and, and you've done a great job sort of outlining that. And, um, any thoughts you have about, uh, some of the implications of either overhead lines for trucks or battery powered, uh, locomotives? I think at the end of the day, we just have to ask ourselves, what is our priority and what are our goals with our transportation system? Is it to serve people? Is it to serve equitable development? Is it to serve the environment? Or is it to serve a special interest? And in my opinion, they're car salesmen. <laughs> it's not much more complicated than that. And I think we as a sort of civilization have to decide how we're going to use the technology. We can't let the technology decide how they're going to use us. And like I said, you know, I'm not an enemy of, of any of these technologies, but any medicine in excess is poison. Um, and I think that's sort of a, a collective realization for us as a culture and us as a civilization is that everyday citizens need to, to know about these things and make a conscious decision in how we're going to use them, not just 
passively accept how people want us to use them and make them work for us. Thanks, Robert. I, um, even though I was in the work group that helped um, give you feedback for this presentation, I learned so much from hearing the whole thing put together tonight. Really my learning curve about battery production as well as battery disposal and recyclability, which is not a problem that's been solved either. That's been a very steep learning curve very recently. Um, I am in fact an owner of a Prius. I bought a Prius, you know, trying to do, play my part um, something like 15 years ago. And it's a very good car and I still have it full of dents and covered with bumper stickers. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm probably not gonna get another car when this car uh, is no longer functional. Um, influenced by the kinds of consciousness raising that I, that's happened to me recently through working with you. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask a question about the psychology. I'm sure you've thought about this. Um, so many of us, uh, especially, you know, middle-class people, uh, wealthier people, um, predominantly white people, but people of color too, who of means have been raised in this country with a dependency on cars and an assumption that we must have them and that we'll always have roads. Um, and it's helped us forget about other options like trains, in fact. But I, the question is really, would you, you know, give us some reflections on, would you reflect some on, on the psychology of, you know, changing our minds about how we think about um, how we get around, um, how we get around with friends and family members, how we go grocery shopping, you know, you know, this sort of thing. Um, pandemic has helped us rethink some of that, but, you know, how do we liberate our minds from the car culture that we've all grown up in? Thanks a lot. Yeah, no, that's a really awesome question. And I think I might've spoken a little bit about this um, when I presented my thesis to you all, but I'm a big proponent of the movement called tactical urbanism. So, which is the use of very strategic, small scale, low cost um, installations meant to show people a different way of doing things. So using small installations with the hopes of having a big impact. I think something as simple as taking three potted plants, putting them with your neighbors to block off your street and having a block party and showing how great it is just to have kids kicking a ball to walk across the street without worrying about being struck by a vehicle. Something as simple as that for one evening, one week could have such a great impact. Um, you know, I think what's so great about this campaign in particular, it's, it's about involving everybody affected by these issues, not imposing something on everybody like happened, like what happened with the interstate. Um, but I think there's a lot of really creative ways to share that with people where rather than, than telling them, you're simply showing them and allowing them to experience it and realize it for themselves rather than sort of taking a teaching approach, you know, make it fun, make it creative. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation, Robert. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I really uh, enjoyed the part about the pollution from tires and from brakes. And I did want to point out that rail isn't totally innocent. We also have, uh, uh, brake shoes on uh, rail cars that do produce a, a certain amount of particulate matter, uh, as do the wheels against the rails. Uh, but that's, I think, less uh, hazardous. It's primarily steel flakes uh, that are produced. But uh, with regenerative braking, which both electric vehicles can have, and trains, if they are using overhead wires, using regenerative braking, uh, minimizes the use of the brake shoes. So that that is a technology that helps offset the, the brake uh, dust. But my question was, um, Toyota particularly, and I think some other, uh, that the Germans also are promoting hydrogen as an uh, energy storage medium, and they can use um, renewable electricity uh, to produce hydrogen uh, and that's yeah, renewable 
yeah, electricity from renewable sources uh, to produce hydrogen, which then could be used to fuel vehicles. And it, it uh, is a pretty dense energy medium. And do you see that? Is there any downside to that to technology uh, in use in vehicles? I believe as well that the waste of that when it gets used is water, um, which sounds great, but I believe even water in excess can function as a greenhouse gas. Uh, think is a green, you know, a literal greenhouse where you have your plants. Um, that's the first thing you see is the condensation on the glass and the heat in there. Uh, and like you said, the the energy that goes into to producing that. Even solar panels have pollution. They use heavy metals and they're not recyclable. And I think with all of these technologies, whether you're talking about the brake shoes for the rail, solar panels, all these things, I think people in this culture are so used to things being good, evil, black, white, that at the end of the day, it's, it's how we use them and how we balance their impacts. Even an organic farm may have once been an old growth forest and that was a sacrifice. And I think that's sort of the nature of life is there's always a sacrifice and we have to be really conscious of how we're doing these things. Um, you know, using heavy metals, using things that pollute, to power a hospital, to power the things we need to live, we need that. And I don't feel bad about that, especially when if we use them more wisely, we can more effectively with our limited resources, mitigate their impacts. Whereas if we're using all this technology just to ship around disposable clothes and disposable electronics and electronic waste and these things, I don't think that is an ethical decision. Um, and I think that just applies to sort of everything. I can't see any of them as good or evil. And to be frank, I don't feel that way about petroleum either, um, especially when I look at sort of a developing nation that you know, needs to meet certain goals. It needs to feed its people. It, it needs a stable grid to power its hospitals and its schools. I don't think that's the same as us as a developed nation using these things for, for frivolous reasons. And I think we have sort of an obligation to do a little more on our side so that if they have to use them for whatever reason, that's okay. Um, it's, it's sort of a, a balance. And, you know, the first sort of thing that came to my mind when you mentioned the, the shredding of the steel, um, you know, as a landscape designer, we talk a lot about bioremediation, the use of plants to absorb pollution. Um, there are many plants that uptake metals. They're used to clean up industrial sites. They're used to, even for mining now, there are areas where rather than big chunks of ore, metals are dispersed in soils and we can plant a certain type of flower and harvest those flowers, extract the metals, recycle them and use them in industry rather than um, mining for, for them elsewhere. And the more we can use efficient technologies such as rail, the more we can afford to use those technologies. You know, got to buy the plants. There's a sacrifice for that. You got to maintain them. You got to hire people to do all of that. But I think when we use the more efficient choice, such as rail, all those things become more affordable, more possible, um, and more feasible to achieve that balance between the good and the bad. You know, uh, building on that, Robert, I would just say that the uh, this concept of efficiency is something that has become more and more uh, critical, or has been, and more and more in my um, in my on my mind lately in relationship to solutionary rail because of the complexities of the problems that we're trying to address. And the um, uh, one of the things that we've been starting to talk about is the idea of rationalizing the um, the the use of and not rationalizing like rationalization, but rationalizing where's the greatest efficiency of the utility of a highway or road system and the utility of a track. We're not exact, we know that where there's gonna be situations where we're gonna need those trucks and there's gonna be built-in efficiencies that, that outweigh the, the, poss the possible benefits of shifting to a train. And, in, in, and likewise, there's gonna be situations where at a certain place that that certain freight has no business being on the roads at all and it needs to be on tracks 
So finding those sweet spots and having a sense of the cost benefit um, of is what I'm starting to call rationalizing the use of the interstate highways with the interstate railways and harmonizing these various uh, elements of our energy and transportation infrastructure. And then I think that kind of the, what Mary is getting to is really uh, fundamental about, wow, it's more about, it's also about culture and social change, like culture, shifting culture. And Clyde's point around hydrogen, to me that ultimately comes down about to, is it the most efficient use? Is, is the transmission a more efficient that uh, you could use those surplus electrons from that renewable source of power more efficient ultimately than turning it into uh, hydrogen as a storage mechanism? So this uh, rationalization and harmonization is something that's really active for me. I just wanted to respond real quick to what you just said. Uh, I think as well, people need to get used to the concept that what's right for you is, is not what is right for me. Um, what someone in a place with no sun needs versus a mountainous place versus a place with water, they're all going to need different technologies. Um, and likewise, different communities, whether they're rural, or they're urban, different makeup, they're going to need different things. And uh, uh, we just have to sort of get used to that, that we need to be different. Um, we're so used to sort of this globalized, here's the one good thing, everybody must have it. And I think that's what got us in this mess. Well, that's place. a really good point, too, in terms of environmental justice principles, because part of the environmental justice principles is community self-determination and communities having their own solutions so that we're not imposing solutions on communities, but they participate through processes where they're at the table rather than, quote unquote, on the menu. All right. right. To you, Larry. Bring it on, Larry. Okay, I've got a, a few observations. I think one of the attractions of electric cars is it's a one-dimensional answer to a really complex problem. People think, okay, if I get this, I'm helping the planet, and all I need to do is put a charger in my garage. But if people are not thinking about where the power is coming from or all the other trade-offs we're talking about, like the environmental colonialism we're talking about, it's a solution that can be a bigger problem than we realize. Um, there are a set of rules that were come up with some years ago by, I believe the man's name was Draper Kaufman. They're called Kaufman's Rules, and they're kind of a foundation of what they call systems thinking. And the first two rules really apply here. Rule one is everything is connected to everything else. Real life is lived in a complex world system where all the subsystems overlap and affect each other. The common mistake is to deal with one subsystem in isolation as if it didn't connect with everything else. This almost always backfires as other subsystems respond in unanticipated ways. And rule two follows on this. You can never do just one thing. This follows from rule number one. In addition to the immediate effects of an action, there will always be other consequences of it which ripple through the system. So that's the kind of thinking we've got to adapt to here if we're going to really deal with climate change effectively. Okay, that's pretty much what I had to uh, bring up at this point. I would add a point about, we also need to look at you making better use of hydrogen for energy storage. We're talking about running electric vehicles. They don't care if the power comes from a battery or a fuel cell. So a lot of te technology can be applied to both kinds of uh, power storage. I'm thinking, for example, uh, agriculture. Farmers have a lot of land. They have intense energy needs. Uh, fossil fuels are a big cost of crop production. If a farmer can set up wind turbines or panels on those huge barns they have and use that to collect hydrogen for power all the equipment they use, that would be a big feedback mechanism there to get uh, carbon out of agriculture production, as well as make them a little freer of all the market price fluctuations that go with oil shocks. That could be a big difference right there. And farmers are used to buying big equipment, big ticket items and putting it to work. So this will be one place to get started. I think that will do. Hey, no, thank you for that. Those are all really awesome points. Um, I think, you know, getting into systems thinking is, you know, I think in, we're sort of used to 
viewing everything as how it can serve us, where rather now it's a time for an age where everyone who's affected by something needs to be involved in every decision-making process about that. And in a way, I think that's incredibly liberating. I think people are often like, well, if buying an electric car is not enough, if going vegan is not enough, what can I possibly do, you know? And that's a scary thing, you know, we wanna have that answer, but I think it's not just okay, but necessary to be like, I don't have the answer. I need to talk to the other people who are in this with me. Um, and it's, you know, an extra step, but you know, then in the future, that person likewise is going to check in on you when you're affected by something they're doing and is really going to be the most beneficial for everybody. Uh, you know, maybe some people think that's you know, the core of democracy. I think that's the core of a lot of pre-colonized cultures, um, in so many ways. And I think it's sort of like we're more returning to something ancient than innovating something new, really. You know, you say that right now, and I'm just finished, I'm in the midst of reading uh, or listening to uh, 1491. And, um, and so, you know, where I say, I also feel like the indigenous perspective where things uh, that of ultimate value are not for sale is at the center of, of a paradigm shift that we're looking toward. Um, and at the same time, I think it's, it's also very important to not make assumptions or rash, uh, romanticize um, uh, uh, cultures that we don't, you know, and generalize. Um, at, so, and at the same time, I think that uh, the issue that, again, I feel like you're helping us return to is that this is an issue of building movement. Like social, uh, Solutionary Rail is a backbone campaign, is a movement building organization. We're excited about Solutionary Rail because it's, it's, caught, it's, an, it's a way of bringing people into relationship through uh, their, uh, a system that connects us all. And so what you're doing, I feel like, is you're nudging us a little bit more to keep pushing, keep, okay, you got the vehicle, you got this, you got that. How about relationships? Social movement power is relational power. So um, I think it's very exciting to be challenged the way you're doing this. I just want to do a shout out to everybody who attended and say thank you to you all. <laughs>